Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-Centered Leader in Confessional Broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ. And to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians read through the Book of Concord and discuss what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we continue our study of Article 7 from the Epitome of the Formula of Concord, looking at the affirmative statements where we get that wonderful phrase, we believe, teach, and confess, with regard to the teaching on the Holy Supper of Christ. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Dual Parish of Emmanuel West Point in St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois. And my companion confessor in conversation about this article today is the Reverend Dr. Christian Preuss. He is pastor at Mount Hope Lutheran Church and Classical School in Casper, Wyoming. Pastor Preuss, welcome to Concord Matters. Thank you for having me on. It's a real honor to have you on. And uh, before we jump into reading these affirmative theses here, I, uh, you know, in this kind of uh, safer at home time and so forth, I have a lot more time to do reading and catching up on on listening to uh, to things and so forth. And I found on YouTube uh, from a 2003 Lutheran lecture series, uh, a presentation by Reverend Dr. Kurt Marquardt, um, who was at Concordia Fort Wayne uh, for many years as a professor. And he was talking about something that I think summarizes what we talked about in the status of the controversy last week and is going to be helpful for us in understanding what the Lutherans are doing here in the affirmative theses. And, and he said, you know, it seems like there's hundreds of denominations and churches out there and seemingly uh, new ones all the time. He even joked in, in that uh, lecture series, uh, he said, it seems like every day there's two new ones just in California alone and things like that. And so sometimes we get overwhelmed by these things. But he said, really, there's three basic positions or three great confessions at least in the Western church. He said, there's the Roman Catholic, the Lutheran and the Zwingli Calvinist. And he said, everything else is basically variations on these confessions. And so he said, you know, as Lutherans, we confess grace alone toward Rome and we confess the means of grace towards Geneva. So that would be the Zwingli Calvinists. And uh, he said, one without the other is not good enough. The grace of God, the gift of God that he has given to us in his son, This becomes concrete and is given to us in the varied forms of the gospel. And so these need to be defended and confessed. Otherwise, the gospel becomes an abstraction. And so he said salvation by grace alone, yes, but also the holy means of grace by which this comes. And that defines precisely the biblical confession of our Lutheran church. And I thought that that was a good summary of what we talked about last week with regard to um, the status of the controversy That if you look at the Augsburg Confession, um, which the Zwingli Calvinists were in early on and so forth, but then pulled out and and were not with us at all, that we just don't share a confession with them on this, uh, especially when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Um, The Augsburg Confession primarily confessing grace alone toward Rome, right? But now here in the formula, uh, we're going to talk about some of those, those issues that we have with Rome still here as well. But we're primarily looking at confessing the means of grace toward Geneva. And so as, as that's kind of my summary and setup here, any thoughts on that, uh, Pastor Price? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a great division, uh, similar to what uh, Pieper does uh, when people say there are so many religions out there. How can I pick the right ones? And Pieper just very succinctly says, no, there are two religions. One is the religion of grace, and the other is the religion of works. So which one are you going to pick, right? You could also say there's the religion of the Bible and the religion of all man-made, uh, man-made religions. Um, but I think that's a good division, those three in the Western Church, Roman Catholic, uh, Lutheran, and then uh, theology that comes out of Geneva. Though our Calvinist friends, at least the conservative ones, would probably cry foul there. 
and uh, uh, very much distinguished themselves from the Zinglians because the Zinglians properly, if we wanted to be fair, would uh, say that it's nothing but a representative meal. Um, and the Calvinists would say, no, this is a sacramental meal. That is, that Christ does come to us here, and he does give us everything um, that is uh, that he won by his life and his death. He just doesn't do so with his real body and his real blood. Um, in fact, in the negative statements, which of course we're not going to get to today, but in the negative statements, the um, confessors actually have to make that clear um, that it's not just the benefits that are coming um, to us here. It's his actual body and blood. And that's against the specific Calvinist uh, reading, which still makes it sacramental, and yet at the same time uh, denies that it's Christ's body and blood. That being said, there's a reason we can categorize uh, Geneva as Geneva um, and Zwingli with uh, Calvin, and that is because once you say it's not Jesus' body and blood, the uh, the eventual result is always the same, and that is that you stop um, uh, thinking of uh, the, the supper as something that God does for you, and instead you start thinking of it as something you're doing to remember Jesus. Um, so it devolves into a uh, representative meal, uh, even amongst the Calvinists. Yeah, and I think that's a, a entirely fair point that you've highlighted for us too, and we kind of brought in last week as well. Is that there's, I, I, I'll kind of call it a spectrum for a lack of a better term in, in that Zwingli Calvinists or what we're calling the Sacramentarians here, um, and 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 we certainly highlighted that last week as well. All right, you ready to go ahead and jump into the affirmative statements then? Absolutely. All right. We got a lot to cover here, so let's do it. So again, uh, on this show, we read from Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord, available to you from CPH, the publishing arm of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. And this is the epitome of the formula of Concord, Article 7, the Holy Supper of Christ. And this is uh, beginning the affirmative statements, paragraph six, affirmative statement number one, the confession of the pure teaching about the Holy Supper against the sacramentarians. We believe, teach, and confess that in the Holy Supper, Christ's body and blood are truly and essentially present, and that they are truly distributed and received with the bread and wine. We believe, teach, and confess that the words of Christ's testament are not the understood are not to be understood in any other way than the way that they read, according to the letter. So the bread does not signify Christ's absent body and the wine his absent blood, but because of the sacramental union, the bread and the wine are truly Christ's body and blood. All right, so Pastor Preuss, I, I, I went ahead and took the first two affirmative statements here, but I think they're connected together. So, so Christ is truly and essentially present, uh, and his words are to be taken literally. Go ahead and uh, break that down for us. Yeah, so uh, the first statement uh, just by itself, the, uh, the clever sacramentarians would be able to get around and say, Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's truly and essentially present, according to it, uh, according to the spirit, or something like that. But then uh, the Lutherans have to keep on going, just to clarify and say, no, we are taking the actual letter. This is my body. This is my blood, exactly as it says. Body is body, and blood is blood. And so it does not simply signify Christ, and that's a deliberate word, absent body and the wine is absent blood. That is, it's not really there, um, but only signifying it. But because when they use this word, the sacramental union, which we'll, um, be, they'll use later on too, the sacramental union, the bread and wine are uh, truly Christ's body and blood. Uh, another thing here is the adverbs are important, truly and essentially. You know, if you're using uh, your, your word processor, a lot of times Microsoft Word will uh, tell you that you should get rid of words like actually and truly and really um, because people use them too much. But in reality, if you're using them properly, uh, they clarify things. And that's what we have had to do with the Lord's Supper is to say it's really there, truly. That's where words like the real presence come in. 
yeah, there, there's a reason that the, the words exist, right. Uh, is, is to give that clarity. And, and, I, and, and I kind of agree with the word processor in the sense that maybe sometimes we overuse them when we don't need to, but here Absolutely. we clearly do. Uh, and that's a clear confession against their teaching. Um, so how is it then, um, that they are saying you, you were, you were, kind of getting at there that, uh, you know, they were clever and kind of excusing that, but, but how are they getting around the, this truly and essentially present then? The sacramentarians? Yes. Uh, this is, this is, uh, they pretend this is uh, in uh, paragraph uh, four, actually, in the introduction, the status of the controversy, uh, that they pretend that they also believe a true presence of the true essential living body and blood of Christ in the Holy Silver. Supper, however, they say that this happens spiritually through faith. So they'll use those same words, but then they'll clarify that oh, we mean spiritually. Uh, so uh, it becomes necessary for the Lutherans not just to use these adverbs like truly and essentially, but to um, we'll have an entire article <laughs> in the form of, of, of Concord um, uh, arguing and stating and confessing and teaching exactly what we say. Yeah. And, and thanks for that connection back to the status of the controversy. And I, I like how you even used, uh, uh, already, even before I brought it up that, that, that word crafty, you know, that, uh, is used there. Um, but then also this is going to be brought up, as you said, um, again, a little bit later. And so we're going to come back to this. Uh, so, so we'll file that away and then push forward here. All right, so this is picking up with paragraph eight, uh, affirmative statement uh, number three. Now, about the consecration, we believe, teach, and confess that no work of man or recitation of the minister produces this presence of Christ's body and blood in the Holy Supper. Instead, this presence is to be credited only and alone to the almighty power of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, we also believe, teach, and confess unanimously that in the use of the Holy Supper, the words of Christ's institution should in no way be left out. Instead, they should be publicly recited as it is written in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing that we bless and so forth. This blessing occurs through the reciting of Christ's words. All right. So uh, the significance of the consecration is not in the word of man, but in the word of Christ, and it shouldn't be omitted in any way. Go ahead and break this down for us then. Yeah, so this is um, responding to uh, maybe a, a Calvinist criticism, but also, you know, that, oh, well, you're giving too much power to the pastor, that he can, like, magically make the body and blood of Christ appear. But also then uh, against the Roman Catholic teaching that it is the indelible character, that's what they call it, that is bestowed on a Roman Catholic priest through ordination, which they claim comes all the way back goes all the way back to the apostles, they call it apostolic succession, that the, the priest is actually endowed, endued with the power to change the uh, bread and wine into um, the body and blood of Christ. So uh, they locate it uh, in the power of ordination and so forth. Um, there's a fancy Latin term for that, the ex opera operantis, so from the work of the worker. Um, and uh, that is from the work of the consecrator himself. And the Lutherans are uh, very careful to say, no, the power is in the Word. The power is in Christ's original institution, uh, which we have in Scripture, of course, recorded in Scripture, and it's not in uh, some special power, uh, which you know, kind of becomes magical in, uh, in, in the pastor himself. Uh, rather, uh, it, it, it's the, the power exists because of Christ's command and his promise, this do in remembrance of me. At the same time, you don't omit the words of uh, institution, uh, because the words of institution uh, are um, what blesses uh, these um, uh, the elements, and that in accordance with uh, the, com the very command of, of Jesus. Also, what uh, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, um, that which I received, I also delivered to you, and then give them the words of institution, clearly showing that they actually say these words of institution every time they have the word suffer. 
I, I think that's really important to highlight what you just brought out there is that, you know, this, this is the clear practice from scripture um, that, that we would actually say the words of institution as we, um, uh, you know, have the Lord's Supper and that St. Paul is, is clearly working with that in mind when he says, look, I received this right? And I, and I gave it mm-hmm. to you, and, and this is to continue on. And I, I think also here we, we start to see kind of how I set up the show, too, that we're still confessing towards Rome, but, but also towards Geneva. And, and you know, sometimes this, this tends to be thought of that, that the Lutherans are kind of in the middle of, of these kind of two positions then. Is that a fair way to think about this? Are, are we really in the middle of these two kind of thinkings, the, the Roman Catholic thinking and the uh, Zwingli Calvinist thinking? Well, I don't know if that's a proper way of thinking of it or not. Uh, we're in the, we teach what the scripture teaches and we have to, we have to uh, uh, refute the errors on, on both sides. So there, uh, I suppose you could say there's, there's a middle way, but it's a scriptural way. Um, the, uh, the Roman Catholics uh, and and the Calvinists, though, are both alike in that they depart from Scripture, right? So uh, we could we could say that they are more alike than we are um, uh, in the middle between them, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm totally with you there, and and that's why I brought it up is because again, this is commonly thought, and 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 I can even he- have, you know, I remember times that it was taught to me that way, and uh, and and I. I've, I've kind of shifted my thinking over time to more what you uh, helpfully brought us to. There, there's a clear scriptural teaching on this, and, and we're not worried about being in the middle or anything like that. We, we, we refute those who contradict scripture, which is true that they do on both sides. And, and our whole purpose as Lutherans um, is, is to be clearly confessing the scriptures. This is what Christ clearly teaches and, and gives to us in the church to believe. And so uh, I think that's a very helpful way to, to think about this, is we're, we're, we're confessing what Christ says. Yeah, I think, and we could, we could also talk about the similarities between the Calvinists and the, and the Roman Catholics in that they, they make it uh, man's work in one way or another. Uh, as opposed to what you just read in paragraphs eight and, and nine of of uh, the formula, um, Article Seven, where the whole point here is that this is God's power and God's power alone. The Roman Catholics say, "Well, uh, if you don't have a priest, uh, uh, um, and 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 the power that he's endued with, you're not going to get the sacrament." And you're not going to get the effects of it because he's the, he's the only one who can uh, sacrifice it, right? So it's made into a sacrifice by the priest. Uh, so his work. And then on the other side, you have the Calvinists who once again make it into man's work. Um, that is that if you don't have faith enough, it's not going to be Jesus' body and blood, right? Your spirit has to go up into heaven. So you can even see that there's, their positions are similar to each other uh, in in that respect, uh, even though superficially it might seem to people that we're just you know kind of taking a middling position. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point that you bring in there. That you know ultimately this boils down to the the work resides with man, and that's going to come back a little bit later too here. Um, but uh, I, I think you've laid out that really well that, you know, whether whether we put it in the priest or or on the recipient end of, you know, my faith, my believing enough and ascending into heaven in this spiritual way and so forth, um, ultimately it boils down to us. And that's not the way that grace alone works, right? Exactly. All right. Well, let's go ahead and push forward because we have a lot of affirmative theses uh, to get to here. So we're going to pick up with paragraph 10. Uh, and this is affirmative statement number five. In this matter, the ground on which we stand against the sacramentarians is what Dr. Luther has laid down in his confession concerning Christ's Supper. The first point is this article of our Christian faith. Jesus Christ is true, essential, natural, perfect God and man in one person, undivided and inseparable. The second, God's right hand is everywhere. Christ is placed there in deed and in truth according to his human nature. He is present, rules, and has in his hands and beneath his feet everything that is in heaven and on earth, as Scripture says in Ephesians 1.22. 
where no other man or angel but only Mary's son is placed. Therefore he can do this. The third, God's word is not false or deceitful, citing Titus 1 verses 1 through 3. The fourth, God has and knows of various ways to be in any place, and not only one way, which philosophers call local or localis. All right, so Luther has laid down the grounds of our faith and position in, in, in these uh, four points. So go ahead and uh, explain those for us. Yeah, Luther's, Luther's fantastic. Um, and uh, the, the Stella Declaration quotes him at even greater length, uh, and it's, it's well worth reading. Um, you see this, but it anticipates the eighth article of the Formula of Concord, um, and that is uh, the two natures in Christ, that he, Jesus Christ is true, essential, natural, perfect God and man in one person, undivided and inseparable. Okay, so uh, if this is true, then where the man, Jesus Christ, is, or where, the, where God, Jesus Christ, is, there the man also must be. Um, that's just the way it works. Jesus' body is God's body, and God doesn't go anywhere without his body. Otherwise, he hasn't actually taken on a body. He hasn't actually taken on human nature. So this gets into uh, Christology. It gets into the teaching of who Christ is. Did he actually become a man, really and truly, so that his body is the body of God? Um, beautifully, we just had on quasi murder identity or Easter 2. I think the three-year series also has uh, John 20 um, uh, every year for this this beautiful uh, Easter reading where Jesus comes in through locked doors. Well, the body of a man, a normal man, who is mere man, can't do that. But God's body can pass through locked doors, right? Uh, uh, Because it's God's body, and God does what he wants. His body and the laws of physics don't get to tell God's body uh, what he can't can't do. The second is uh, we confess that God... uh, Jesus Christ uh, has been exalted to the right hand of God. Now, the right hand of God is not uh, a, uh, a, a literal right hand, right? God is spirit. That's what uh, Jesus says. Um, God is spirit. He doesn't have a literal right hand, unless you're talking about Jesus' right hand. But the Father doesn't, right? He didn't become a man. So right hand in all of Scripture and actually in secular ancient youth, the right hand meant strength. Right, uh, God's right hand and His right arm wins him the victory. Right, we're talking about strength because most people are right-handed. They draw the bow with their right hand. They wield their sword with their right hand, and so forth. So when it it says that Jesus sits down at the right hand of God, uh, what that is saying is that Jesus, even according to His human nature, has been given, as Jesus Himself says, all authority in heaven and on earth. And Luther says it succinctly. God's right hand is everywhere. Everywhere where God is, uh, there is his right hand. And so therefore, the man Jesus rules uh, there also. Uh, The third, God's word is not false or deceitful. So we can trust it, period. Uh, And it doesn't uh, deceive us with strange allegories where we wouldn't expect it. For instance, when Jesus himself says, on the night he's betrayed and he gives his last will and testament, this is my body, this is my blood, he's not joking, he's being literal, it is not false or deceitful. And then fourth, God has and knows of various ways to be in any place, not only one way, which philosophers call local. So the only way that we, according to our eyes, can see um, uh, being in a place is locally. So my scissors are in a cup on my desk, and it takes up space, right? Um, But my, uh, but God's uh, location or where God is is not necessarily local; that is taking up space. In fact, God doesn't take up space. When we say God is everywhere, we're not saying He's inside a cup. We're saying He contains all things, right? Uh, So it's a it's a different kind of presence, a different mode of presence. And we can't simply uh, put on God all categories of um, being in a place. God, God doesn't abide by our categories. He is spirit, uh, and he is God He's everywhere. So it goes with the body of God. Obviously, the Lutherans are not saying, and the Roman Catholics don't say it, no one said it, that Jesus' body is locally present somewhere, that, it, that it's taking up space. If it were taking up space, then it would... Uh, pierce holes through our walls, 
and it would expand the bread, right? If it were taking up if it were taking up space, we would actually be able to put it under a microscope and look and see the cells of the body and blood of Jesus. Um, that's that's absurd. Um, but the point is, is that Jesus' body um, has now the pr- uh, the presence, uh, according to the mode that God's uh, divine nature uh, exists, that it contains all things, and therefore it can be present in a way that a normal body can't. That is, it can be present without taking up space. And so that's what he's saying in that last thing: that God has and knows of various ways to be in any place, and not only one way which philosophers call local, that is not only one way, which uh, is the only thing that science can see that is taking up space. Um, and you see this, like Jesus disappears before the uh, two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He disappears, right? It's not as if um, his, 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 uh, his individual cells like separate, take up space and so forth, and transport elsewhere. He's just not there. And he, uh, he's able to, uh, uh, pass through space in a way that doesn't take up space. Uh, also, when he goes through walls, it's the same thing. You ha- we have to realize that since his body is the body of God, it can do things that we are not, uh, that science can't measure. It, and I think this is a really important point to, to, to make here uh, th- that feeds right into our next point, the, the affirmative theses, which we'll have to get to after our break here in a minute. Um, but you know, so, so this thought is going to continue, but I think w- the way you started as well is also really helpful, um, that, you know, this anticipates article eight, the next article you said, uh, which deals with the person of Christ. And it's also a part of this, what we call the crypto Calvinist controversy, uh, which we talked about last week and setting up the whole controversy as well. And, and we'll talk about when we get to, to article eight, but ultimately, what we're talking about when we're talking about the Lord's Supper and what God does here is we're really talking about Christ. And, and this is, this is how Christ works. I mean, this is how the incarnation is, is, you know, well, how can God be in heaven, but then take on this human flesh? Well, well, that's how God works. Right. And so, uh, we're, we're ultimately, once again, as we always highlight on this show every week and as true Lutheran confession, we're really talking about Christ here. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and take a break and then pick up this, you know, taking up space uh, Jesus body issue as we push forward into affirmative statement number six. So please come right back after this. Hello, I'm Gary Duncan. The COVID-19 pandemic is affecting our routines, vocation, and worship. Recently, you received a mailing about our annual share fundraising event. However, during this unprecedented time, KFUO Radio is postponing our on-air portion of share until June 25th through the 27th. Gifts can still be made through the mail and online, plus those gifts will be matched by this year's matching fund. I know times are tough, but when you are able to bless our ministry, please do so. Opportunities to share the hope that is ours through Jesus Christ increase at times like this. And as a partner, you provide for those in our neighborhoods and around the world to hear the gospel message through KFUO Radio. I pray for you and your safety, and I ask for you to pray for KFUO, our staff, and volunteers during this difficult time. And again, our plans are to move the broadcast dates of our on-air share until June 25th through the 27th. Thank you for listening and supporting KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. And welcome back to Concord Matters as we're talking with the Reverend Dr. Christian Preuss, the pastor of Mount Hope Lutheran Church and Classical School in Casper, Wyoming. And Pastor Preuss, right before the break, you were really helpfully explaining for us that that Jesus's body just does, well, let's just call, go ahead and call it God things, right? You know, uh, for lack of a better term, supernatural things. And, uh, and so he's not bound to kind of the the, the philosophical terms and things that we tend to think of being local. Uh, you know, you talked about his body taking up space. If, if you put it under a microscope, uh, you wouldn't see it and so forth. And I think this really ties into 
uh, th- this next point uh, as it's a logical progression. I mean, they're they're very clearly using uh, proper logic and rhetoric, as we've talked about many times on this show, in setting up the whole of Book of Concord. Um, they're really, really smart guys um, doing great work um, uh, as they lay this out in a logical way. And so the progression then proceeds. Uh, we're picking up with this as Article 7, the Holy Supper of Christ, of the Epitome of Formula of Concord, Affirmative Statement Number 6, Paragraph 15. We believe, teach, and confess that Christ's body and blood are received with the bread and wine, not only spiritually through faith, but also orally, yet not in a cabernetic eating, but in a supernatural heavenly way because of the sacramental union. Christ's words clearly show this when Christ gives direction to take, eat, and drink, as was also done by the apostles. For it is written in Mark 14, verse 23, and they all drank of it. St. Paul likewise says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? That is to say, he who eats this bread eats Christ's body, which also the chief ancient teachers of the church, Chrysostom, Cyprian, Leo I, Gregory, Ambrose, Augustine, unanimously testify. All right, so a couple things. First, you're going to have to explain for our listeners what's this Capernetic eating uh, or, or Capernetic way um, and, 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 and build upon this progression, this logical argument here um, that Christ's body is truly present, but, but in, a, in a special way. Yeah. So I might take the first part, uh, or the second and the second part first, um, and that is that the words of institution and uh, uh, the, the apostles uh, and the evangelists all stress that things are eaten and that they're drunk. All right? Uh, so something is eaten and drunk, and it is the body and, and the blood. That's how you receive it. And that's, that's, that's the point they're making. There's, no, there's just no getting around those words. Jesus' body is eaten. Jesus' blood is drunk. Now, okay, that's what we got. So then people want to misunderstand these and say, no, that can't happen. You can't, it can't be true that we're eating and drinking Christ's body and blood because that would be cannibalism. And that is what is referred to as Capernaic. Um, This comes from, that is the accusation that this would be cannibalism, that we'd be chomping on Jesus. Um, and this comes from uh, John chapter uh Six, where uh, Jesus tells uh, the, the crowds uh, who have come out, they've actually just received uh, bread from him, uh, that is the feeding of the 5,000 men plus their, their wives and children. And uh, he tells them that unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood, they have no life in them. And uh, <clears throat> they uh, take him to be saying that they're going to actually need to uh, eat his flesh and drink his blood in a raw, you know, like cannibalistic way. And they're unbelievably offended uh, uh, by what he's saying. In fact, Jesus Jesus kind of rubs it in, and he uses a word for eat, which kind of means chomp, uh, trogo. Um, and, uh, uh, but they, they understand it in this, this, this gross, cannibal-like way. And uh, what the Lutherans are saying is that, of course we're not talking about that. That's, that's disgusting. Then we would be cannibals. Any, everyone would condemn that. Don't ever think that we're talking that way. In fact, the Calvinists would accuse us of being like Thyestes and, uh, and Polyphemuses, uh, that is uh, the Cyclops, uh, ancient uh, uh, mythological characters who actually ate um, raw human flesh and blood. So they would, they would, uh, they would call us these horrible names, uh, insinuating that we actually believe that like we're eating a, a, the toe of Jesus. Um, or that we're gnawing on him uh, with our teeth, or we're digesting him, and so forth. And they got even more disgusting about it. And the the point that the Lutherans consistently made is that God can be present with his body in whatever way he wishes, and he is not, uh, uh, you, you can't get around the word, this is my body, this is my blood. Um, so we are not talking about a... Um, a Capernaic, a gross, uh, cannibal, cannibalistic eating. Instead, we are talking about a supernatural eating, wherein Jesus gives us his body and blood in such a way that it does not take up space, uh, that it can't be tasted or anything like that, 
Uh, we would never talk about it being digested or anything. Jesus doesn't say take, eat, and digest. He just says take, eat. And he doesn't say take, drink, and then um, get rid of the waste, right? He says take, drink, right, for the forgiveness of sins. So all of these crass ways of talking about it are really a uh, like a mask to try to get around the clear words of Jesus, which are, this is my body, <laughs> this is my blood. Well, it can't be that way. It can't be that way, because then that would be disgusting. Uh, not even realizing that Jesus, um, uh, not only does he mean what he says, but he can do, he, he can be present with his body and present with his blood in the manner in which he says, um, that is not locally, and then also for our benefit, uh, and not um, and not simply for uh, like physical uh, satiation. And it's because of that sacramental union, as as they say here, right? And and this has shown up in a in a few different ways. Um, uh, one of the things that I've highlighted on this show before, I think we were going through the the apology of the Augsburg Confession the last time I talked about this, um, that. Uh, one of the things that the 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 Calvinists would do, and and this was especially present under the uh, the Union churches uh, when Calvinism was kind of forced on the Lutherans and and kind of made them get along together and so forth. And and it's part of our ancestors in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod were were escaping that and, and coming over here. And so it kind of makes me laugh when I see this practice in the LCMS today. And again, I'm not condemning anyone. I was I feel like I make this point every every week and so forth. We're just simply talking about. Uh, theology and what we confess with what we do, and 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 these this is just true history as well. But I'm not condemning any pastoral practice. It's usually done with with good intentions and just a lack of knowledge of these things. But but what I'm going to say is is that the uh, the the Calvinists would develop this practice where they would break the bread in front of the congregation. And, and, and the Lutherans that do this today would just simply say, well, it's because he took it. It's the words he took bread and broke it and gave it to them saying, right. Um, but the Calvinists would do it in, in a way of, and this is literally in their writings, you know, take, look, see, there's no Jesus in here. You know, you can't put it under a microscope as you talked about uh, before our break, you can't put it under a microscope and find any Jesus uh, cells in here or things like that. Right. Um, and, mm-hmm. and, and yet, um, you know, that, that is a clear confession by practice that we, we don't agree with because in the sacramental union, we believe Christ is truly present there. Why? Because he said so. And we take Christ at his word. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, we're not, we're not expecting to put it under a microscope and find Jesus cells in there, as you said, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah, an additional reason the Calvinists did that is because, uh, the biblical prophecy that's, uh, confirmed in John when, uh, the, uh, the centurion come or the soldiers come and they they don't break Jesus' uh, legs so that he'll die faster because he's already dead, so they pierce his side. And uh, that is to fulfill the, the, the scripture uh, that they'll look on him whom they pierce, but also uh, that not one of his bones will be broken. And so the Calvinists, by breaking the bread, are saying, see, this isn't Jesus, because his body cannot be broken. Right? Um, so it's a real... Uh, it was it was deliberate uh, teaching against um, the real presence, the bodily presence of Jesus in the sacrament, which is why Lutherans never did it. And you're right; uh, some uh, um, some pastors today, Lutheran pastors, will un- you know, do that, not knowing the, the the history behind it, and of course, just trying to follow the words of an institution that say he broke it. <laughs> Yeah, I often I often joke, especially with my congregation when I talk about this. My congregations, you know, I grew up in South St. Louis, not too far from where uh, uh, Pastor Walter served, uh, first president of Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and uh, and so I often would joke and say, you know, I, I can just see him flipping over in his grave every time a pastor does that, you know, here and things. So anyway, it's <laughs> it's just an aside, uh, um, and I don't actually believe he's flipping over in his grave. I believe he's uh, worshiping with the saints uh, around the throne of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amen. All right, moving forward here, though, a uh, lot more to cover yet. Uh, so this is picking up paragraph 16, affirmative uh, statement number seven. We believe, teach, and confess that not only the true believers in Christ and the worthy. Oh, wait, sorry, that was a poor reading. We believe, teach, and confess that not only the true believers in Christ and the worthy, but also the unworthy and unbelievers receive Christ's true body and blood. 
However, they do not receive them for life and consolation, but for judgment and condemnation, if they are not converted and do not repent. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven through twenty nine. Although they thrust Christ as a Savior away from themselves, yet they must receive him, even against their will, as a strict judge. They must admit that he is just as present to exercise and render judgment on unrepentant guests as he is present to work life and consolation in the hearts of the true believers and worthy guests. Now, just especially the way that we've kind of broke up uh, reading through the affirmative statements here, uh, it, this seems like a completely out of left field change. And and I've always made the point on this show that, you know, there's a logical progression to these um, uh, to, to the work that is done here in the Book of Concord. Is this out of left field or, or what's the progression here? What What's the point that they're driving at here? Yeah, no, it's a it's a perfect progression uh, in uh, maybe a little historical uh, background in the Wittenberg Concord of 1535. Um, Luther, uh, met with uh, a bunch of, uh, the, um, of the Protestants who weren't Lutheran, but they're trying to come to an agreement on the Lord's Supper. And they ended up writing some theses in Wittenberg, and it was called the Wittenberg Concord, where they said that even the, um, unworthy receive the Lord's Supper. And Luther insisted on this because, um, uh, if... Uh, what what the sacramentarians would do is they would say, oh yeah yeah we believe that Christians receive the body and blood of Christ, but they uh, but they meant they did it by faith and spiritually. So Luther said, okay, do the unbelievers receive it? Because if the unbelievers receive it, that means it actually is the body of Christ, whether we have faith or not. Right? That is, it depends on the word of Jesus' institution. This is my body, and not upon someone's faith. Right, and they actually agreed to. Um, so a guy named Bootser, Martin Bootser, uh, he's from Strasbourg, uh, not a Lutheran, but he agreed to it. And Luther communed with them uh, at Wittenberg uh, because it said the uh, uh, in, in the Wittenberg Concord they agreed that even um, the unworthy receive it. Well, then Bootser goes back to Strasbourg, and they're mad at him because they're like, we don't believe this, and he says, he says, no, 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 I'm saying unworthy Christians, they still believe. Right. <laughs> so so he, he got around it that way. Um, and uh, so, so the, the, the point here in this progression is that you notice that it says not only the true believers in Christ and worthy, but also the unworthy and unbelievers. And this is to just nail down that it is the body of Christ by virtue of the institution of Christ, uh, whether you believe it or not, so that someone who, uh, that is, it does not depend on your faith. So if you come and you do not have faith, you just start doing this because your mom and dad told you to, or because this is what you've always done or whatever, you are still receiving the body and blood of Christ. Your faith does determine whether it's the body and blood of Christ. But instead of receiving it, uh, Christ as your Savior here, you will be receiving him as your judge, because Christ uh, gives righteousness, forgiveness to the believer, but he gives um, he gives judgment and condemnation to the unbeliever uh, through the same body. Now, this is a point that has come up on the show uh, before. Here, are we talking about when we, we've talked about on the show before how when the Reformed practice the Lord's Supper, we as Lutherans confess that they don't actually have the Supper. All right. That's right. But here... What what are we talking about? Does that tie in here? Does this, um, you know, are they unworthy because they don't have the supper? Or, you know, how do, how would that idea tie in? Are we are we trying to connect these sorts of issues together here at this point? I don't I don't think so. I don't know if we're addressing uh, that issue whether the reformed even have the supper or not. Here, it is addressed uh, in the Salad Declaration, um, but uh, the. The, the, the Reformed don't have the Supper uh, because uh, they don't exercise, or they, they don't, uh, the words don't mean what they say, uh, sorry, the words of institution that they say, they claim, mean something completely different. In other words, they're basically saying when they consecrate, this is not my body, this is not my blood. That's, uh, that's, that's their uh, public confession. 
And so it's not done according to the institution of Christ, and therefore is not uh, the sacrament. So they would just be eating bread and wine and would not be receiving Christ's body and blood to their condemnation. But if they came to a Lutheran church um, where we follow the true institution, uh, and so therefore have the Lord's Supper, and they came uh, thinking that this is not the body of Christ, denying the body of Christ, then uh, they would not be having faith in that body and could be eating to their uh, judgment. Thanks for handling that really well. As as you were talking, I was thinking I didn't really set him up really well with this, but but right. <laughs> and, and what I wanted you to break down is is you know it, it's not that would almost be on the the Roman side, right? That it becomes the the confession of the priest and those sorts of things. But but really, it's it's what is the confession of the church? And in a, in a Reformed church, they're not confessing that this really is Christ's body and blood, and so they just don't have the supper. And you're right, that's brought up elsewhere, and so we, we'll address that elsewhere as that comes up. And so we're not saying, you know, you're, you're unworthy because of what the way that you're celebrating, um, but when you come to the altar where this is truly confessed that this is Christ's true body and blood, uh, to be received here. If you're not believing that, then you receive that to your judgment as first Corinthians 11 says, right? Which then would seem to, and we're going to get into this big time when we get into the negative statements, but this would be then a case for the practice of close communion, right? Uh, because it would be an unloving thing to extend something, uh, in judgment to someone who doesn't believe in the real presence, right? Absolutely, especially if they don't believe in in the real presence. Yes, that's one side of the Lord or of of close communion is that this could potentially be harmful to those who aren't of our uh, same confession. It would be harmful if they're actually denying the body and blood of of Christ and then uh, eating and drinking it. Um, but I think as we read the next couple of paragraphs, we'll be able to uh, talk a little bit more about. Um, closed communion and um, uh, why we do it. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and push forward then. So picking up with paragraph 18, uh, 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 affirmative statement number eight, uh, and again, continuation, this isn't a, a change in direction as you laid out well for us from, from uh, you know, is Christ really present to the unworthy and worthy? I think you handled that really well, but then this is a progression on that worthy and unworthy guest. We believe, teach, and confess also that there is only one kind of unworthy guest, those who do not believe. About these guests, it is written in John 3, verse 18, whoever does not believe is condemned already. And this judgment becomes greater and more grievous, begin, being aggravated by the unworthy use of the Holy Supper, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. And then I'm going to continue with paragraph 19, affirmative statement number 9 here. We believe, teach, and confess that no true believer, as long as he has living faith, however weak he may be, receives the Holy Supper to his judgment. For the Supper was instituted especially for Christians weak in faith yet repentant. It was instituted for their consolation and to strengthen their weak faith, citing Matthew 9, verse 12, 11, verse 5, and 28. All right, so uh, there's there's really only one kind of unworthy guest, and then also in the true believer, uh, even if it's a weak faith, uh, not received to the judgment. Go ahead and explain those for us. Yeah, so the only unworthy believer, as it says, is the one who does not have faith in the Word given in shed to forgive sin. I mean, that's the small category stuff that we all... We all memorize. Uh, um, fasting and bodily preparation are indeed fine outward training, but he is truly worthy and well prepared who has faith in these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. So, any Christian, no matter uh, how weak um, and uh, his faith is, um, becomes to the supper, uh, trusting that this is the body and blood of Christ uh, shed for the forgiveness of his sins, he's worthy, period. Now, uh, that does that should encourage all of us to receive the sacrament for the, um, frequently um, and not look inside ourselves uh, to see, um, oh, have I done enough works? Um, am I the type of person that, you know, that Jesus would accept uh, to his altar, to his rail? Uh, instead, it is, uh, it is simply uh, a humble faith that says, you know what, I need this because I'm weak, because I doubt, uh, because uh, I'm a sinner, um, and I need the forgiveness of my sins and the strength to continue as a Christian. 
Um, and so uh, that is the only requisite is faith in those words uh, for the reception of the supper. And obviously faith also entails uh, a sorrow over our sin, and a sorrow over our sin, and we trust in Christ with forgiveness. Now, I, I did want to talk a little bit about um, closed communion in this respect, because there are Christians out there who are not Lutherans, uh, who are not part of our confession, who believe that it's the body and blood of Christ, um, and that it's for the forgiveness of their sins. There's probably some Reformed people who believe that. They just don't know their church doesn't teach it. Um, in fact, I've run into those people before. <laughs> and there's plenty of Roman Catholics, too. So if they came and took uh, the Lord's Supper at a Lutheran altar, uh, they would be worthy guests. That is, they would be they wouldn't be condemned. Um, we have to take these these, these uh, words seriously. If he is truly worthy and well prepared. Let's faith in these words. Um, so that goes regardless of your church affiliation. So uh, on the one hand, you would say uh, for close communion, we would say we we have to make sure that the Baptist who doesn't believe it's the body and blood of Christ, or the the Calvinist who doesn't believe it's the body and blood of Christ, or the Methodist or whatever, um, that they don't eat and drink for their damnation. But the other reason we practice uh, we practice close communion is because coming to the altar is also a confession of faith, and it would be lying, even if you believe it's the body and blood of Christ. Uh, if you're a Roman Catholic and you come to a uh, Lutheran church, you're also confessing everything that's taught from that altar, which is uh, which is in contradiction to the Pope, right? Because we teach grace alone and faith alone and Scripture alone, and uh, the uh, the Pope and the Roman Catholic priests reject that. Um, so there are two sides to the closed communion uh, coin. And uh, one is, for those who do not believe it's the body and blood of Christ, we want we don't want them to take the body and blood of Christ to their harm. For those who do and you uh, disagree with the Bible and the Lutheran Confession on other points, we also uh, ask them to not come to the altar because it would be uh, a false confession. And not that they're unworthy guests, but that it would be a false confession. They'd be saying one thing when they go to the Roman Catholic altar and another thing when they come to the, uh, to the Lutheran altar. I think you're absolutely right there. And, and I like how you said, you know, that they are worthy guests and, and that is a, a true confession that they hold. They just don't know it yet uh, because they've been a part of that uh, denomination sitting under that teaching uh, and associated then with that confession. And so I've often got it this way, you know, when I have that conversation, it's like, well, you know, you realize, I'll just say to them, you know, uh, you realize you're actually confessing what we confess as Lutherans. So how about we talk about you becoming a Lutheran so that you don't have this kind of uh, broken fellowship where you're, you're going to a church body that doesn't agree with you. I mean, how helpful is that? All right. Um, and it's actually exactly. worked a couple times. So it's really, really kind of wonderful. With just a couple minutes here, though, I think this is drawn to a beautiful close in this last affirmative statement and, and does, as we love to do on the show so much, uh, brings us and focuses us right on Christ as our confession for all of this. It says, paragraph 20, affirmative statement 10. We believe, teach, and confess that all the worthiness of guests of this heavenly feast is and is founded on Christ's most holy obedience and perfect merit alone. We receive these for ourselves by true faith. And by the sacraments, we are assured of them. Our worthiness is not at all in our virtues, our inward and outward preparations. All right, so you kind of talked about that. It's not our worthiness isn't what I've done, the works I've done, and so forth. But go ahead and bring us uh, to a close here focused on Christ, Pastor Preuss. Yeah, I love uh, Luther's statement on this where he says, I have no uh, virtue of my own or in myself called either faith, love, or hope. Uh, but instead of all these, I place Christ himself before me, and I say, there is my righteousness. And uh, the point there being that even when we talk about faith in these words, uh, uh, being making you a word to get, well, what is faith? Faith is, is just holds on to Christ, that's it, right? Faith is empty without Christ. So Christ is its essence, it's its form. And so what makes you truly worthy is simply Christ. So don't look inside yourself in the end. You look, when you look inside yourself, you're going to see doubts and sin and so forth. Look at Christ, who has died for you, who has lived for you, who has risen from the dead, and who now comes to you in his love and grace to give you what he died to give you. 
That is excellent. Thank you so much, Pastor Christian Preuss, for joining us for Concord Matters today. It's been an honor to have you confessing for us the clear biblical teaching on the Holy Supper of Christ. And if you have a question or comment that you would like to leave for us to address the next time we convene for Concord, you can leave us a message by phone 314-996-1542, email kfeo at kfeo.org, find us on social media at kfeo radio. Thank you for stopping by today, and until next time, keep confessing, church.